Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome all of you to Guruswami Center for another episode of Deccan Dialogues. We've been having this series of dialogues on current topics mainly. And also we have tried to look at some topics which are to do with history. 77 years have passed since the partition of India in the emotionally charged immediate aftermath of the partition. Perhaps it was impossible to analyze it in terms of pros and cons. But now, more than 75 years later, perhaps we can dare to ask, was partition good or bad? for India. To try to answer this question, we have two eminently qualified personalities with us today. Professor Ishtiaq Ahmed He is a political scientist and a professor emeritus at the University of Stockholm, Sweden. Born in Lahore, just three months before the partition of India, Professor Ahmed is also a researcher into the history of partition and in how and why the military has gained an upper hand in Pakistan. He has unearthed several new facts with his research and uh, he has used a lot of hitherto unknown primary sources of information. In writing three seminal books over the past, uh, just over a decade now, uh, which deal with the partition of the Punjab, with Jinnah and his role in partition, and also on Pakistan, the garrison state, as he calls it, which deals with the uh, emergence of military as the primary force in Pakistan. Mohan Goroswami, you all know, he is an economist, he is a Hyderabadi. He's an expert on world affairs, especially on security issues. He has worked in government, in the private sector, in academia. He's widely traveled. He's a well-known columnist in several newspapers. And also, he's a sort of a benefactor of Sikandrabad by coming up with this center here, Guru Swami Center, which is built on his ancestral property. Uh, the aim behind Guru Swami Center was to give Sikandrabad a cultural, a socio-cultural center which was lacking in this part of the city since long. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our two conversationalists to the stage, Professor Ishtia Ahmed and Mohan Guru Swami. And I thank you once again for taking time off from your busy schedule on a working day and coming here and gracing this occasion. And then we would like to have a question and answer session after the conversation is over. Thank you very much. Just bear with us for a minute or so until the audio is brought under control. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you know, you, uh, we consider ourselves a different city from, from Hyderabad. And the three cities here, Saibarabad, Sikandrabad, and Hyderabad. Sikandrabad today is the smallest part of the of the tri-city area, also uh, <coughs> seems to be the most neglected part of the tri-city area because we, like Pakistan, we live under the shadow of a military government nearby. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> uh, so there's little, very little scope for expansion, very little scope for Hopefully, only Skandrabad does not the whole of India. <laughs> so you know, I wrote a, I wrote a, I wrote a piece when the army said that you can't go through the cantonment. I wrote a piece saying that this is not Pakistan, General Sir. You know, <laughs> that uh, <coughs> here the civilians rule the roost, and so we got the roads open, and said that you, and the land doesn't belong to you. The land belongs to the people. So uh, we still have ways of asserting ourselves. Whereas I think uh, the basic difference between the two countries has been that uh, you've been uh, have become a guided, military guided democracy. Quite. Whereas we are heading towards a, 
uh, a theocracy of a different kind. Uh, but in the end, you know, both of them become unicracies. They are uh, dominated by, bureau uh, by a bureaucracy which is there for its own reasons, because of birth and because of the color of clothes they wear. I think we will also be defined very soon, or we have a chance to upset the apple cart by the color of your hat and, you know, the color of your shawl. Uh, I meet a lot of generals from your country even. In, I've been in the Pakistan track too for about 25 years. Mm. And so all the general subs who uh, I've, I, I'm always fascinated by how uh, committed to democracy they become after they retire and uh, how committed to peace even our generals become mm. after they retire. You know, so. uh, <clears throat> but while you're in office, you become a part of a system right. where you cannot express yourself. I've also been in that system where you can't speak freely. Part of the pursuit of career is that you can't speak freely. That you got to speak for the, what you perceive is the majority view. Ki, you know, PMs of kya bolenge. So that becomes the dominant. So I suppose it's the same in Pakistan. But now we have two countries have arrived at a certain juncture. Uh, questions are being asked by people. In Pakistan, questions are being asked in the provinces, in Sin, Baluchistan, Bakhtun Khwa. In our country, uh, we are asking questions by, in the manner in which we vote. Now, there's a cleavage in between the North and the South in this country where <coughs> the South votes differently and the North votes differently. The questions in the South now, as they asked in Bangladesh in 71, as to we pay most of the taxes or more taxes, and why do we get so little from you? The questions which were answered in Pakistan by the rise of Bangladesh. These questions are being discussed now at the incipient stage. But I think a time is coming when India will have to deal and that we have to also learn the lesson of Pakistan that religion doesn't bind. If religion was binding, then you wouldn't have had so many fissiparious movements in Pakistan. And religion cannot bind India. Therefore, I think our founding fathers in their wisdom said that we must have a new nationality. So the nationality was based on reason, based on the notion of equality, based on the notions of, of economic growth, of scientific temperament. And this was the new Indian, the entering into the brave new world. But in the last 10 years or so, we've seen a reversal of that notion of an Indian into an Indian who is determined by his birth. Citizenship in India today is now being determined by where were you born, you know, and to whom were you born. And um, it reminds me a lot of, uh, maybe you can recite it for us, of uh, the, the poetess from Pakistan who said, Tum bhi hamare jese kitne nikle yeah. you know, So we are becoming, so I call it in a way that we are heading towards becoming a, a Hindu Pakistan. Hmm. So is there any lesson for us to learn from, from what happened in Pakistan? where uh, people have lost their rights, where we are under the threat of losing our freedoms, and um, we are seeing chief ministers being locked up in jail, and uh, foreign countries are beginning to comment on it. This we thought at one time happened only in, to the west of us, but it is beginning to happen here. So, how 
do you think in this light of what has happened here, whether the people who wanted two nations uh, in the, the Muslim homeland and the Hindu homeland, I won't credit Savarkar with wanting a Hindu homeland. Uh, it was a demand much older than that. And the demand for a Muslim homeland, interestingly enough, was inspired by two Englishmen, Beck and yeah. um, in, in uh, Mohammedan Anglo-Oriental University in Aligarh. Uh, but where do we go from here now? We've partitioned it to, there's a lot of nostalgia, particularly interesting enough in the RSS, ki desh ko tor diye. So I keep asking them, ki, you have a problem with 14% Muslims in this country, or aap Pakistan ko bhi mm. If Pakistan didn't happen, we would be about 40% Muslim. And the whole notion of this country was that majority rule came for the first time to India in 1947. Why democracy? Uske bale hote the, small groups of people. In your book, I saw how, how few foreigners, Muslim foreigners, ruled this country. Right. You know, Aurangzeb's regime had only 1,000 Uzbek nationals who were with him, and they ruled this country. So, um, question for you, therefore, is that as a Pakistani scholar, what does this country do now? What do you think should happen in this country? What is your advice for us, given your experience in your own country? Thank you very much, Mohanji, for this, these introductory remarks. And I've been saying for a long time what this poet said in a verse, that don't emulate Pakistan. It all started with maybe a naive idea that you can build a modern nation on the basis of uh, religion and faith. But as they tried to elaborate it, instead of finding common ground for what became Pakistan with a majority Muslim population, uh, all the historical differences, the linguistic variation uh, came forward and it, the net result has been that uh, what I have said somewhere is that if you follow the logic of exclusion, one day you find you are all alone yourself. So that's what's happened to Pakistan. Uh, in 1947, Mr. Jinnah was successful in, in convincing the Muslims that in a united India, Islam will be annihilated, I'm quoting him verbatim, and Muslims will be obliterated, also quoting him. And the Hindus and, and Sikhs, I'm talking about West Pakistan, we can keep Bangladesh separate because it, had, it became part of the Pakistan story in only April 1947. Earlier, the idea was there would be two Pakistans, an Eastern and a Western Pakistan. But at the end, they were tied together. Coming to West Pakistan, uh, with all the Hindus and Sikhs gone, it was then a problem of who's going to rule Pakistan. And the majority happened to be the Gaulis. And, uh, although they were even more observant as Muslims, but West Pakistani elite had a poor opinion about them and, and I would say they mistreated them. So 
on the basis of language a separatist idea developed and ultimately culminated in the 1971 breakup of Pakistan. Within Pakistan then, uh, the story that was propagated was that uh, we have always been saying that India wants to undo Pakistan. And the 71 war is a proof of that. So we have to defend the rest of Pakistan beca by becoming truly Islamic. Doing that proved to be, uh, I would say, disastrous. Because among Muslims, from day one when the Prophet died, there was a dispute over succession. And that has been part of Islamic history as a divisive factor, Shia versus Sunni. And then among the Sunni majority, people had doctrinal, dogmatic differences. Brailvi versus the Diobandis, the two versus the Ali Hadith. And the more they tried to find what is true Islam, the greater the number of people excluded from that category. I am sure if you were to uh, sort of try to create a Hindu Rashtra based on the Hindu nation, all those differences which are inherent in this society, you have the caste system already, which theologically divides and stratifies people. And I think that will come to haunt you. And then you have the South, as you tell me, and the North. And all those differences would uh, weaken India in the long run. Winning elections by playing the religious card is a short-term <coughs> strategy. But in a philosophical, long sort of view of how uh, societies develop, change, go forward, I think this is myopic. So my advice would be, be loyal to your, be faithful to your constitution and the idea of India. I think it was a noble idea. It was philosophically, morally, ethically, a beautiful idea that anybody who's born in India is a part of the Indian nation. And so the Indian constitution is an admirable, uh, framework for going forward with such an idea of India. So I think I have responded to a question. Remember, I am a visitor here and my visa could always be in jeopardy <laughs> if I were to go further. Aji? So within that limitation, I can respond to more of your queries. Talking Aji? about visa, talking about visa limitations, yeah. my first visit to Pakistan, I went to Karachi mm. and there I was told in the hotel that your visa is restricted to Karachi. Okay. You can't leave Karachi and you have to report to the police, police. station at yeah. 5 yeah. every evening. So I hadn't realized that that was, I had gone in a group. So I said, I'm not coming to the police station. I'm not giving you the passport either. So they didn't know what to do. The organizers were a little worried. So we came up with a typical Indian solution. That we'll put a constable with you. Yeah. So he'll travel with you. Anyway. <laughs> so, so I would go with this Havaldar. And when I wanted to leave the hotel, we used to go. One day I wanted to go to Thatta mm, to see Thatta, the yeah. uh, necropolis. He said, Sahib, you are in my way, I will go to Mali. So he took me to Thatta, showed me the place. So we work out arrangements. So that's the genius of the two countries. Right. Which I said, this is just like us. Our here is like this. If you come here, then... But um, talking about being reported, our reporting systems are not very good. Uh, there was a meeting of the Joint Intelligence Committee in Delhi once and the chairman called me up and he said, uh, Mohan, what have you been saying? So I said, uh, I went for a, I had previously had spoken, had gone to Tibet. Incidentally, along with uh, RAW chief, both of us go to Tibet and we are doing a slideshow on the IIC on what we saw in Tibet. 
So, and this Tibet is a land of great beauty. And so I made some whimsical remarks on Tibet in China. And how, but next morning, the sub-inspector, Bichare ko limitations of language, wo likh diya ki bohot pro Chinese. Pro Chinese. Pro Chinese. So, so don't. Ab jo bhi kahe, keh lijiye freely. It will be reported tomorrow as very favorable. Actually, ye dono societies basically ek hi hai. To ye ek border na ho, to koi fark nahi hai actually. मैं तो इस सत्त तक यकीन रखता हूँ कि इस सिमिलरिटी को अगर जोर से डिनाई ना किया जाए तो शायद ये जो बॉर्डर बना हुआ है ये अपनी जगह ना रह सके तो इट्स पार्ट ऑफ द पॉलिटिक्स टू कीप ऑन एम्फोसाइजिंग द डिफरेंसेस गिवन अ चांस यू नो द नंबर ऑफ Hindus and Sikhs who have been to Lahore or to any part of Pakistan, the reception they receive is so warm and so generous and so welcoming that the official notion of all Pakistanis hating India and Hindus doesn't hold water. And uh, you know, I have a YouTube channel and uh, the amount of abuse I receive from India at least the names are Hindu names, <laughs> is unbelievable. But I've been here now for all these weeks. I've not met a single person who's been hostile to me. So there are these organized lobbies who are out there to demonize, dehumanize the other. But somehow, and that is uh, the hope that in the people, the wisdom of all this Centuries is very different. You can keep on telling the story of Muslim invaders, but you can't hide the fact that the Mughal Empire would not have lasted without the Rajputs joining the army and, and being part of the empire. And I'm told that Shivaji's most trustworthy man was a Muslim. So if you go through history, it's not as simple as Hindu versus Muslim or the other way around. And I would say that governments everywhere, unless they are committed to a very strong ideology like uh, the race theory of Hitler or the Zionist theory of Israel, you know, these are racist demonizations of the other. And even Islam, if you put it to that role, you end up uh, dividing humanity in a way which only invites trouble in the long run and we have all the proof uh, for us, in front of us. In Pakistan now, I heard yesterday Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif saying that we should celebrate the religious pluralism of Pakistan and uh, he sent his best wishes on holy to the Hindu community. Earlier on, our finance minister, uh, Ishaq Dar has said that we will start trading with India. And I'm claiming that this is my position. I am saying Pakistan's uh, uh, way out of this quagmire is by normalizing relations with India and trade is the way forward. So, so if these sounds are being made in Pakistan, I hope we have a reciprocal sort of you know, responses from India. Here they are saying okay, we can't forgive and forget certain things. Now, that's not a very encouraging sort of remark. It's a very political remark. It's an election related remark, but it's not the statement of a statesman. So, there are problems on both sides. Historically, when one side has been willing to go forward, somehow from the other side, more often uh, from Pakistan, the peace offer has been sabotaged. Uh, I would say that in 1962, when India went to war with China, 
Zulfqar Ali Bhutto who was I think foreign minister mm. strongly advised General Ayub Khan to start a war on the western front but he refused to do that so there have been occasions when Pakistan has acted in a South Asian sort of way and not exploiting the weakness of India. On the other hand, we have had Vajpayee Sahib coming to Pakistan with a peace offer which I think was uh, very warm, sympathetic and generous. Even the Kashmir issue was part of some sort of settlement where all sides were included and then we sabotaged it. And then Narendra Modi ji went to a private wedding and Pathan court happened. So we are hostage to these constituencies, which is also, by the way, present in India, maybe not so easily identifiable as in Pakistan, but who don't want the people of this region to live in peace, build trust and go forward. So the question is, was the partition good or not good for India? I think that's what you have the theme for today. Depends on how you look at the consequences of the partition. I have argued that if it had not happened, it would be good for everyone, especially for the Indian Muslims. Because Mr. Jinnah's two-nation theory, besides dividing the subcontinent, also divided the historical Muslim community of a thousand years here. Nobody talks about that. And uh, uh, the bloodshed which took place in 1947 continues to haunt the politics of this region. So had the partition not taken place, the Muslims of the subcontinent would have India as much as their home as the Hindu Sikhs and so on. So I would say the politics of today are a consequence of the partition. So if we could do without a partition, things would have been very different. I'm not saying it would be all smooth sailing. There would be all these narrow-minded communal problems. But historically, I think these problems during the Pre-colonial, when I say pre-colonial, I mean the British period before that, uh, whosoever was the ruler accepted the framework that the ruler is the protector for, of all communities. And more or less there was peace, uh, Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Christian, whosoever. It's only in the colonial period with the census records objectifying religion as a point of division and then, of course, British policy and our own politicians complicating matters, ultimately came the partition. So had the partition not taken place, uh, I'll give you an example. You talked about generals when they are privately speaking and when they are in an in a official position. In, in June 1947, after the 3 June partition plan was announced, there was a breakup party in Quetta at the uh, officer something which is, you know, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and staff college. A staff college, staff college Quetta. And General Yahya Khan, then a major, uh, was an instructor. And so the British Indian Army was breaking up now. It was the breakup party. And uh, Colonel... Uh, Verma, he got up and said, well, we have been one uh, brotherhood, we have fought in wars together, and we have all those close relations. Now we are becoming part of two nations. So I congratulate you for getting Pakistan. Let's hope this friendship uh, continues to define the relationship between India and Pakistan. So he made these very, uh, I would say, uh, warm uh, remarks. Yahya Khan gets up and says, Sir, what is there to celebrate today? 
today is a day of mourning. Together we would have been a great power. Now we will start fighting one another. And in 71, the same man had to conduct the war because then he was the president of Pakistan. So an individual who is free to make an opinion is one thing. But once you are part of something like a state organization, your own freedom is gone. So I think <coughs> the partition for me has been a regressive act and its negative features are still haunting us. And uh, uh, so the two nation theory is now part of the Indian politics very much. We are still wedded to this Ghazwa Hind and so on, which I think is nonsense. <coughs> and uh, But such occasions when we get a chance to express a dissenting point of view and intellectuals, academics, artists, I think they have a role to play in, in combating the negativity which was unleashed in 47 and still is part, pervades, permeates our relationships. Does it also reflect the internal arrangements in Pakistan where uh, one region, Punjab dominates yeah. Pakistani polity and, uh, and therefore it needs an animosity with the neighbor to continue its dominance over the polity. I keep wondering about that. And I keep telling my Pakistani friends, we've taken care of our Punjab problem by making them a small state. Mm. You know, only 4% of India. And so, uh, but uh, Pakistan has settled with this problem. Uh, where there is overwhelming there dominance. Is, there is a demand to create a Saraiki speaking province in southern Punjab. Uh, but still, no doubt help by still our I people. think it would still be 48% Punjabis, even if this 7% is taken away. So, Punjab is too ubiquitous in Pakistan to be affected mm -hmm. by some meandering of, of, of borders and so mm -hmm. on. Pakistan is Punjab actually and, and uh, for good and bad, mostly bad now I think. And for the first time the Pakistani state which I mean is the establishment or the army, uh, their uh, claim to be the custodians of Pakistan is increasingly being challenged in Punjab. <coughs> so that is a new trend and, and hopefully things would change with time. You see, Pakistan has been able to get away with impunity because every time it was in trouble, uh, some foreign donors was willing to help. The Americans, then came the Saudis and now the Chinese. And I've said to my Indian friends that uh, you claim that yours is a 7,000 years old civilization and the Chinese claim they have a 5,000 years old civilization. What is the proof of that? Where is the wisdom? Why can't you sort out your border dispute? My own theory is that as long as states have their borders uh, uh, ambiguous, undefined, there is bound to be the security issue paramount in one way or another. So if, if India and China can sort out their border sort of problem, uh, Pakistan's role for China would become less interesting because despite the fact that India and China are in a sort of position of tension all over, I keep on hearing this, but they have not let their trade be affected by that. Whereas in Pakistan, uh, we don't trade with India, so I don't see the point of, of 
such policy and Pakistan has not been able to influence China to give up trade with India. So why should Pakistan then not in its own interest try this as the only way out? There are two yeah. points I'd like to point yeah, out here. Please. You know, Shuja Nawaz, uh, yeah. who General Asif Zanjua's brother, yeah. and I uh, wrote a long paper I see. on the cost of conflict, okay. you know, widely publicized and published, where we said, what does it cost India and Pakistan not to trade with each other? Hmm. So we, I did a lot of research and it was a well-funded study and did some travel and so discovered that our biggest trading partner, India's biggest trading partner, even today, is United Arab Emirates. Mm, yeah. Now, for many two reasons. One is it's a stopover place for over-invoicing or under-invoicing, and then is re-invoiced in Dubai. So money, the Sheikh is a very respected man here, loved man in India, because he's also a banker. Uh, and the second thing is that there is a good Pakistan trade between Dubai and, and there is Indian goods. So automobile tires go from here to Dubai. I know. And they go to Pakistan from there. Chemicals go. So there is a trade four years ago of $18 billion. But, but the, you know, the clearing is done by a certain group of people yeah. in Dubai and it's unloaded in Karachi a certain group of people. So, uh, in our conferences, we call this the, the Dawood Ibrahim factor. Ki, he doesn't want, the people who control the ports don't want, because that business goes. Yeah. And there's an investment in, it's like, uh, it's like a, the voltage stabilizer in India, business in India. Mm. Because we don't generate 220 Water steady, so we have voltage stabilizers. This trade which goes via Dubai and so. So there is a big Ultimately, trade. it's the people of Pakistan who have to uh, bear the expenses. The same goods are four, five times more costlier. So I would say that this Bombay-Karachi nexus has to be broken. And the way forward is Vaga Atari. That border has to be opened. And, and so one has to make an effort in that direction. Yeah, but you know, it somehow even, even this morning I was hearing uh, on BBC, I heard Malia Lodi say, but Kashmir must Lod be sorted out. Look, if you have to talk about Malia Lodi, then you do something else. So, <laughs> they are third class, failed, they uh, are Diplomats, उन्होंने कुछ भी नहीं पाकिस्तान के लिए की अब बेहुदा लोग हैं आज कोई और बात करते हैं आज but uh, but I think uh, there is a, a constituency uh, in uh, in Pakistan which is quite powerful which uh, demonizes India of course like our constituency which is we need uh, Pakistan if we, uh, we also have our past to demonize. Sorry? We also have our past to demonize. Okay. If Nawaz Sharif doesn't get it, then So, you know, we can demonize. Uh, but uh, to that extent, partition has failed to solve our problems both in India and in Pakistan because we didn't become modern nations. We are, uh, I would say that India's chances of becoming a more robust nation according to the vision of India has been dealt a blow by the partition. And now though that blow is having its uh, impact felt in the politics of India. Pakistan already became a victim of it. So once you create a state in the name of a religion, you don't do any honor to the religion, you only make it part of the political tussle. And the spirituality and the high values of any religion are easily compromised. 
So if you do that in India, uh, the so Sanatam Dharam and all the stories I hear would end up creating all the divisions which have existed historically. Uh, so coming back to this whole notion of the partition, was it good for India? Now, of course, some people are saying that had we had all the Muslims in India and they would be 40%, uh, India as a Hindu nation or majority nation would be under threat. So it was good to have the partition. So that's another way of looking at it. Uh, those who believe in the Hindus must remain in the majority uh, think that the partition, whether it was good or bad in 47, in the long run is good because 15% is still a problem for them. And if they were 40%, it would be a problem uh, for them. So I don't subscribe to that, I think, uh, because it's not just the numbers which matter, but also how they have been trained to think, to understand their rights, their obligations, and their identification with the state. Having created Pakistan, you, your loyalty, demanded a rejection of all your past. And that has created many problems in our own sense of history. And in India, this is going on also. Every time you find a villain at the, in the story, it's always a Muslim. So I think they have learned their last lessons from Pakistan. So this poet, when she said this, probably meant it in a cynical manner. Of course and I is. think that's the point, yeah. yeah. The, um, talking about China, we mentioned trade in China in passing. India can't get off that tiger because the Chinese trade surplus with India is almost 60 billion a year now. Okay. And growing. There will be no pharma industry in India tomorrow if we don't get API right. chemicals from China. The entire base is built on Chinese chemicals. There would be no computers in India unless we get Chinese computers. Even today, with all this talk of mobile phones being assembled in India, the value addition is only 3%. The parts come from from China and they get snapped together here. So we are, there's a dependency with China. You know, the general public says ki wo China se Ganesh aara hai, China se you know, plastic saman aara hai. This is the top end, 1.2 billion dollars worth of things. The bottom of the iceberg is something which we can't get off. It's uh, uh, very easy to say that, you know, China ko aap we have actually contributed, I always write that in the last 10 years, we have contributed a trillion dollars to China's growth by trade surpluses with China. So unless we build, industrialize, but we have a, a free market system here, again ruled by lobbies, which will say that, you know, Chinese trade is good for us. Yeah. But we don't have a still a lobby in Pakistan which says, you know, Indian trade is good for us. No, there is a lobby, by the way. There is Noor Muhammad Kasuri Saab, who's a businessman, and then uh, packages the owners, Sayyid Babar Ali, his son, the two of them has actually issued a statement of uh, saying that if we trade with India, these are the benefits and Pakistan gains more than India does. Absolutely. So, uh, if you go to my Facebook and I uh, upload pictures of every day, Kasuri Sahib is always writing there, hey, you are doing great service and so on. So there are people who uh, think beyond this confrontation with India. And I think Pakistan's existence now is gravely threatened by the, by the failure of the economy. Any society which has failed economically cannot sustain itself for a long time. 
So if they really want to get out of the rut, the only thing they have not tried, they have tried everything. They were part of the military alliances of the Americans. For them, they fought the so-called jihad in Afghanistan. Then in the sectarian conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia, we sided with the Saudis and got the money for it. And now China, with its CPEC and so on, uh, is the only one around. But the Chinese are not so generous with the uh, money they give. I am told that the interest rate is very high and so on. What is your comment on CPEC, CPEC? Well, I think the whole idea was a great one. Pakistan would be by nine, 2019 exporting electricity. But the truth is that nothing of the sort even remotely is happening. Uh, you see, we have allowed the extremist lobby to gain so much prominence that uh, in one of the projects, a Chinese engineer told the workers that when you go for the afternoon prayers, you don't come back and we pay you for the eight hours. Uh, and, and so he, he was going to be lynched. It was just in time that the army came and saved him. So the Chinese must be taking notice of investing so much in Pakistan when Pakistan has not been able to de-link itself with this, with this extremist uh, mindset. So I think China is now skeptical. But real politics depend, requires that to keep uh, pressure on India Pakistan is important for the Chinese. But this is all instrumentalism. There is no principled friendship, I would say. Uh, so that's the problem. It's a very tenuous, very fragile sort of thing. But it can continue for a long time, as long as India and China have not sorted out their problems. This is something I've not understood about Pakistan. Yeah. They produce very fine economists. Sorry, they produce? Very fine economists, ah. very fine banking people, people banks like Citibank, very the good IMF. Political scientists. Political scientists. <laughs> and with all this. They all live abroad. They all live abroad. Ah. Ah. And I asked them, Ki when you have signed this multi-billion dollar deal with, with China, it's a loan. Yes, yes. China. And international in infrastructure loans are never at 7% or 8%. So it is 7 8%. Yeah, it is. is it? Uh -huh. Normal is 1%. Oh, I see, I see. So how did you guys sign up for this? Then two, if you are building a dam, all the cement is specified comes from China. All the steel specified comes from China. The labor comes from China. Labor comes from China. So I said, what is the value addition for you in this? And how did you guys... So nobody is able to explain in Pakistan, how is it We don't even know the terms of this CPEC. Uh, the, the information which has come out is about the loans, which are... The interest rate is so much higher. That's one information. And a few other things. And it's the establishment, uh, one of the generals, I think, made a lot of money and he now runs a big business in home delivery in the United States, General Asim Bajwa, not, hmm. not the Kamar Bajwa. Bajwa, yes. So I have said that unfortunately in Pakistan, we have the Mansabdari system. The emperor is always there and you are in power as long as the emperor is pleased with you and the emperor I mean is the establishment. So while in office, you use the public office for your private gain because you don't know if, if tomorrow you will be in office. So Pakistan has not been able to create uh, institutions, representative bodies, the rule of law in any sense. It's the garrison state as I call it. And I chose the term garrison state partly, it's a theoretical concept, 
but it's also a metaphor. Uh, the idea of a garrison is that uh, it's always on the frontiers or borders of, of empires and so on. So one, the first attack they have to face. The second is that they launch invasions on behalf of the central government. So Pakistan assumed this role in the name of the Islamic Ummah without having the industrial base, without having the economic power to sustain it. So Pakistan's uh, economics is in, in, in a very bad shape. Their political, ideological ambitions and their actual achievements the gap is too large. I have explained this even in Pakistan and they have listened to me but that's all. Nobody follows the advice and I'm not the only one. There are many other voices in Pakistan, very learned people who keep on saying this. General Sahib, we the road between Kashgar to Karachi, Chinese theory, the Chinese Vehicles will be moving, carrying goods to Karachi and then going out and there will be factories Ji. within Pakistan supplying this corridor. So, Sara Chinese he So, I said, then he says, Hame kya milega? So, I said, while the trucks run from Kashgar to Karachi, they, they're going to have punctures. The drivers need to have tea and samosa. So, I'm based there. And he, they, uh, that Lieutenant General actually used that in a meeting in, pa in Pakistan, he says, hum log samose aur punctures repair karte rahenge. Or, or, but you know, the lesson of Sri Lanka is there for, for the whole world to learn. Same lesson terms. Dekhe, lesson wo learn karte hain, jo receptive ho to new ideas. But if you are locked up into an ideology, which is, wo phir, you are blinded. You can't see beyond that ideology. So the ideology is that we needed Pakistan to save Islam and Muslims. And Mr. Jinnah, by the way, on the 30th of March 1941, while in Kanpur, was confronted by the Muslims. And they said that the 1940 resolution demands Pakistan in areas where there is already a Pakistan. Mm, mm. All the chief ministers are Muslims. So what will happen to us? And Jinnah said that I will make two crore, 20 million Muslims experience martyrdom and get smashed in order to liberate seven crore from the tutelage of Congress, Hindu Raj or Sir. So Jinnah, I think, couldn't give a damn about even the Muslims. He just wanted his revenge from Gandhi. I have explained at length mm. that this was a psychological problem for him, that he believed that he was the leader to lead India forward. He had been successful with the Lucknow Pact. Then Gandhi ji comes and takes politics from the closed door sort of thing out in the masses mobilizes the masses and Jinnah felt that uh, he has been reduced to second fiddle and that he was not willing to accept. The occasion to get the revenge came in 1937 when after the elections the Congress leader said that those Muslims who have been elected on a Muslim League ticket must first resign from the Muslim League and join the Congress mm. if they are to be considered for a ministership. And on that occasion then Jinnah finally found his way forward. He told the governor of Bombay that henceforth I'll uh, tell the Muslims that I'll use communalism to arouse their, rouse their hatred, fear, whatever of Hindus. And then that's what he did for the next 10 years. But after Pakistan came into being, that way of thinking is now part of politics in both the countries. 
So I'm answering some of the questions which I think needed to be uh, highlighted. Why all by I think the partition has been a disaster. It's been no good for anyone. We are uh, in in Hyderabad. The uh, we've experienced the uh, a long period of minority rule. Uh, we had uh, at the time of partition, at the time of police action, as we call it. It was not a police action; it was a, yeah. a military operation. Uh, out of the eleven. 71 covenanted civil servants mm. in the state of Hyderabad, only 270 were non Muslims. Ah, okay. 40% of the land of the state was owned by the Nizam as a private estate called Sarfekhas, mm. and another 30% was owned by the nobility and the Zamindars and Zagiratars, who are mostly Muslim. Police action happened and then, you know, very fast transitions took place. Yeah. Uh, the elite left for Pakistan, including some good cricketers. I see. Uh, but the transition was made very quickly here by bringing modern systems. Yes, yes. A new state and uh, the notion of equality. Oh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Forget the past. Peshak. This is, we start a new now. But that is going. Most of our fellow Muslims today feel very vulnerable. And they feel beleaguered in this country. Now, it's not a small population. 175 million is as big as Pakistan. You can't have that many people beleaguered in the country. And, uh, but we are still not learning the history of Pakistan and headed towards victimization of Quite. perceived enemies. That's correct, yeah. But I thought I'm here. As a guest. What is from Hyderabad that I can share with you? And it's uh, Bakhdum Mohyuddin's mm. verse Ye khun na Hindu hai na Muslim hai Ye khun na Hindu hai na Muslim hai Ye tera khun hai ye mera khun hai I think that's the lesson and the wisdom that we should carry from today's meeting Thank you Dr. Sir. Thank you Mohan for a very illuminating discussion and uh, a discussion which touched upon several uh, topics which are of interest you know they may have their origin in the uh, 19 at, uh, at, from the time of partition but they're still very relevant to all of us today uh, I will now uh, we are we are at 730 we'll have a short 10 15 minute question and answer session if in case anybody would like to ask a question from either of our two panelists. Uh, you could just raise your hand and I'll come and uh, you can ask a question. Just uh, please introduce yourself in a you know, very short manner and ask your question to the point. Thank you. Uh, I am Advocate Omesh. Ye jo aap ne kaha कि टू नेशन सही था या गलत था जब वहाँ देखा जाए उस समय उस वक्त तो बड़ा गलत था आज इस वक्त देखा जाए तो हमें लगता है कि सही था इसलिए सही था कि हमने देखा है इतने सालों में हम वी आर बॉर्न आफ्टर इंडिपेंडेंस तो 62 बॉन कि इस्लाम में और हिस्ट्री में भी ऐसा है कि तलवार के जोर पर धर्म को फैलाते हैं और जितनी चाहे जमीन 
नहीं नहीं सवाल पे आ रहा हूँ सवाल पे ऐसे है ना सवाल तो ऐसे ही तो नहीं बता सकते हैं तो तो ये सवाल कर रहे थे सवाल सवाल के पहले उसकी एक जमीन बना रहे हैं साहब आई डोंट माइंड नहीं जी जी तो अभी जब आपने कहा कि जो सनातन यहाँ पे चल रहा है आपके आपके जबान से सुना कि सनातन जो है ये ये भी चलना एक धार्मिक जुनून है ये बात सही नहीं है साहब आप कैसे मान लेते हो कि सनातन गलत है ये पूछता हूँ मैं आपसे क्योंकि ये सनातन में कहा जाता है कि सर्वे सुखी न संतु सर्वे संतु निरामय सर्वे भद्राणी पश्यंतु माम कश्चित दुख भाग भवे तो ये आपका सवाल क्या है सवाल क्या है? तो ये बोल रहे हैं कि आपने कैसे मान लिया कि सनातन के बढ़ने से यहाँ पे उसी तरह का पाकिस्तान जैसा माहौल बनेगा अच्छा अच्छा थैंक यू ठीक है बात ये है कि सनातन तो खैर बहुत पुराना है इसके अंदर कम से कम ढाई हजार साल कास्ट सिस्टम ने जो दलित का और वो उन उन लोगों का जो बुरा सलूक उनसे किया है तो ये उसी का हिस्सा बना रहा है ना अब आप ये कहेंगे जी बात सुने बात सुने एक ही सवाल अब आप कहेंगे कि वेदास में ये नहीं था हो सकता है वेदास में ये नहीं है सोशल प्रैक्टिस का तो ये हिस्सा था तो बस एक ही बात है इस्लाम के अंदर भी रसूल्ला का जो आखिरी पैगाम है उसमें यही है कि ना काला ना गोरा ना अरब ना पर ये सारी चीज़ें हर मज़हब के अंदर एक वैरायटी एक होती है आप उसमें से क्या चीज़ें लेके आते हैं वो इम्पोर्टेंट है हाँ जी उमेश जी जरा और कुछ जुनूनी नहीं है अरे बात सुनो जुनूनी नहीं है तो दलित को मंदिर के अंदर आने से किसने रोका है चलिए विल विल मूव ऑन टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन प्लीज थैंक यू सर पदम इज माई नेम आई एम एन अकेडमिक लेट मी टेक यू बैक टू इफ जिन्ना हैड लिव्ड टेन मोर ईयर्स जस्ट एज नेहरू हैड लिव्ड आफ्टर इंडिपेंडेंस फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम वट वुड यू थिंक वुड हैपेंड वेल आई हैव सेट द टाइम ही लिव्ड he destroyed the basis of democracy in pakistan so had it been for 10 years it would be even more disastrous because as when he became governor general of pakistan he instead of strengthening parliamentary democracy which is the office of prime minister he invested all real powers in the governor general first of all he made mount batten amend the 1935 act to acquire powers which even the british viceroy didn't have and he used those powers arbitrarily to dismiss an elected government of the northwest frontier on the 22nd of august 1947 under the parliamentary system and the 1935 act article 93 does empower the governor to dismiss a government but only if it doesn't have a majority in the house and if there is a law and order situation both these situations did not exist and jena exercised his extraordinary powers to dismiss an elected government so that's the first great uh, blow to uh, a nascent possible democracy second uh, he dismissed the government uh, the the chief minister of sindh who was from the muslim league ayub khodu because once again jena used his uh, powers to uh, acquire karachi as federal territory whereas karachi was the capital of sindh and the legislative assembly was also there and they simply said to the sindhis take your assembly somewhere else so that's the second the third is on the 21st of march 1948 in dhaka he told the bengalis that i tell you the sole language of pakistan will be urdu and that's when the 
Bengalis started the agitation and it ended up finally with the breakup of Pakistan. So 10 years would be too much for him to, to do more damage, I would think. So it's just a myth that if he had, he was no Nehru, by the way. He was the antithesis of Nehru. Huh? Lesson, uh, the lesson out of that is, uh, the lesson of history is that you can't tell this country that Hindi is your language. And particularly, it's a new language created only 150 years ago by the East India Company. And you can't impose it on a whole country and say that this is your language and this is your flag and this is your religion. And that is what happened in Pakistan and they paid the price for it. Hmm. Sir, so, I'm Raman from State Bank. So one senior statesman had said, if you recall, that the world consists of two nations. One is the Muslims and others, implying obviously that the others all can live together, but Muslims will not be able to live with others. Who now, is this? Our nation. No, the name I'm forgetting. No, no, then oh, you should you remember. The question is, is, this mindset, is this the reason why there's so much of strife all over the world, with Muslims especially? Okay. What do you say? Well, I would say like this, uh, <coughs> currently this mindset is a dominant mindset that cannot be denied. Uh, but was it always the case? I would very much doubt because let's say for about six, seven hundred years, uh, there were Muslim rulers in North India. At the end of Muslim rule, only 19% had converted to Islam. So this mission to spread Islam by the sword, allegedly, doesn't seem to have taken place where they were actually ruling. Maybe not far away from North India, but at least in North India. So you have to look at the basis of any rule at that time. I think all wise rulers accommodate the variety. They may subscribe to a particular religion, but they have to, be, have to take all the people with them if they are to carry on ruling. And for example, the Mughal uh, revenue system was established by Raja Todarmal. Haji. The Upanishads and all these were translated during Mughal period. The Brahmins and Kaist especially were in the service of the Mughal Empire. So how do you explain that? I'll tell you how this story has got around. You know, I grew up in Lahore and there were people telling this story. But they were like a free group. Uh, you could entertain them by offering them tea and then they will tell you all this. But they were no main force. It's during the so-called Afghan Jihad that the Americans, along with the Saudis and others, including Israel, by the way, and China, they all invested time and energy in bringing Muslims from all over the world, telling them, don't become a professor of this and that, a scientist. Your duty is to do Jihad. So this jihad ideology, as we understand now, is a gift of British-American manipulation of, of a certain tendency among Muslims. So now that if you look at what the Saudis are doing, do you think they are into this type of uh, thinking that they want to dominate the whole world? Abhi to Hindu temple bane hai, yaar kuch to baat soch ke kiya kare aap log. Aji, people are changing with times. So, objectifying everything uh, with just one group is not fair, I think. Uh. Yeah. We need to stand up. Yeah. I'm Sayyid Inamur Rahman, uh, journalist, sir. Sir, uh, I'd like to go a little back in time and want to ask you about this tennis question starting from Lala Rajpat Rai's statement of 1905 
when he had talked about having two states with Muslim majority and non-Muslim majority. And in that context, and in the context of the 1937 ministry formation, when some deserving non-Muslims were denied chief ministership and ministries, and like in Bombay, like in Bihar, uh, that thing. And then these are the things which, are, which went on to trigger this thing. And then we have the 1946 budget, uh, which for the first time, and probably for the last time, talked about fulfilling the budget de deficit by going by setting targets and going after big tax defaulters. And in my humble reading, that was the straw which broke the camel's back. Because then alarm bells really started ringing among the real powers that matter. And the real powers we know now, we are getting to know that Biden is not the power, Sunak is not the power. There are other people pulling the strings and they are making them do it. So that time also this happened. Indian history, in my humble knowledge, has not been understood, understood in the context of the corporate role in the Indian, in the events which unfolded in India, especially from the time that the corporates, Jagat Seth and Durlabs and he helped the Clive and after that somebody took him to the Durga temple and said since there is no church there you may as well worship here. He did that and so many temples were rejuvenated and we had a series of temples getting reopened and the Devdasi culture going on full swing because the British could not bring their women from England until the missionaries put in a word, put in a strong word. Strong Sir, what word. is the question? What is the question? My, my question is in the context of all of these happenings, how do you say that Indian partition could have been avoided? What about the people? That India is a monolith and India has got a very significant minority of people who pull all the strings. Everybody knows that. Nobody likes to say it. Okay. So there so, it is. So, so we carry forward with myths and we come to know today that the six billion myths, the six million Jews massacre, the six million figure has been there from 1911. So, May, please, no, no. I think, I think, please, please. I think we're going on. No, I think, first of all, I think it's unfair to blame Lala Lajpat Rai. Lala Lajpat, Lajpat Rai's father converted into the Naqshbandi order uh, and was a follower of Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. This is a fact. And he even used to pray. It's only when Sir Sayyid started talking about Hindus and Muslims being two nations that they went back uh, to this position. So this blame game is very easy to play. Lala Lajpat Rai, honestly not. Lala Lajpat Rai's uh, statement is from 1924. I think you are confusing it with Bhai Parma, Parmanan, Parmanan of Multan who made such a statement, but nobody took him seriously. Uh, Lala Lashpat Rai made this statement after 1924 cohort riots in which hundreds or maybe thousands of Hindus and Muslims, Sikhs were killed because somebody had published a derogatory uh, poem about the Prophet. So they attacked the Hindu and Sikh minorities living in cohort. It's after that Lashpat Rai says that we can have uh, so, in reaction to that, such positions have been coming forward all the time, from the Hindu side and from the Muslim side. So, the blame game is very easy to play by just choosing somebody that you want to run down. I think it's not fair. Second, your question about, uh, I, I grant you the point, the 1937 election, and I think the Congress did make a major miscalculation by uh, thinking that since the Muslims have not voted for the Muslim League, they can now force them, the Muslim Leaguers, to abandon it and join the Congress. Uh, Jinnah then pulled out the religious card and started this demonizing and so on. And I don't think partition was at all inevitable while granting your point that there are a few people who are run, pulling the strings, but who were they? I think primarily the future of India was in the hands of the British. In 1943, when the second last Viceroy came in, Lord Wavell, the outgoing Viceroy, Lord 
Lilith Go said that we are here for another 30 years, which means 1973. So the British had no intention of giving up India. It's the Second World War in which while they won the war, their economy was smashed and the Americans put their pressure to uh, vacate India and make it independent. Why? Because the only winner of the Second World War was the United States of America. And uh, the Soviet Union has been had been destroyed, one of the victors. France had been under occupation and British economy was in total tatters. So the new rising power wanted the colonies to end so that American goods could be sold there. Because previously, whosoever colony it was had a monopoly over the trade. So that's when uh, the pressure to leave India uh, was exerted on, 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 on the British government. And Churchill held out till the very end. It's only when he was defeated by the British and the Labour Party came into power that finally the partition was granted. And why did they grant partition? Their basic idea was the cabinet mission plan. People don't talk about it, but actually I've gone through their official documents and the cabinet mission plan is a way of holding on to India by making the princely states decide their own future, mm. by making the central government so weak that they would be dependent on, on the provinces, including a clause that every three, 10 years, the three groups could opt out of India. So it was no recipe for a stable future government for India. And what is not mentioned is that they wanted India in whatever form they were going to transfer power, tied through a defense treaty to Britain. And on the 12th of May, 1947, I quote a memorandum of the British three heads of the armed forces, Air Force, Navy, Army, Field Marshal Montgomery, Lord Ismay, saying that uh, Mr. Jinnah has showed an interest in joining the Commonwealth, whereas India may decide to remain sovereign and independent. And therefore, if partition takes place, we should demand from Pakistan access to Karachi port facilities, Pakistan airfields and Muslim manpower. So as late as the 12th of May, the British army decides that partition is good for their imperial interests. There is a statement by Sir Francis Tucker, it's a two volume book, you, you should read it. It's called While Memory Serves. Uh, and he writes that we need to create an Islamic arc starting from Algeria into Arabia deserta through Persia into northern Hindustan. A Muslim state armed with Islamic ideology and British science to be a frontline state to contain the spread of Soviet communism. So Pakistan was created not for the love of Muslims and the hatred of Hindus, the love of the Muslim League and hatred of the Congress, but for an imperial interest. They thought that they can use a Pakistan dependent on the West to contain the spread of Soviet communism. And it is finally Pakistan which played this role in 1978 onwards in Afghanistan. And so Pakistan's role assigned by the British was uh, achieved during the one uh, you should read not only this book but also the pakistan garrison state i have used those sources whose authenticity nobody can argue and the simla accord 1946 yeah who who sabotaged it jena did he said i will not shake hands with uh, the president of the congress apna uh, maulana abul kalam azad and that only Muslim League will have the right to nominate Muslims. Whereas in the Punjab chief minister, an elected prime uh, chief minister, Sir Khizar Hart Tiwana, he could not be nominated to the uh, uh, interim government that Babel was hoping to. It's Jinnah who is responsible for destroying the Shimla conference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next question, sir. Yeah, my name is G.V. Shastri. And uh, 
I would like to pose two questions. Yes, sir. Number one, what, during the partition, uh, the state of Punjab and the uh, Bengal have been divided. Sorry? Have been divided yes. on the basis of Hindu and Muslim population. Yes. At the same time, by the same census, Sindh was having about nearly 40% Hindu population. 29%. Yeah. I have the figures in the book, so you can check. 29%. Yeah. Okay. Why is it that not a single soul in the, either the Muslim or in the Hindu leadership or other, the Congress leadership, why they have never bothered to take care of these Hindu uh, uh, population? I get they, your question. They, yeah. have to, they have to, whatever they can carry on their hand, with that, they just ran away for I their know. lives. Yeah. Number one. Number so two, why did Sin not get partitioned? You, this is your question? Yeah. Achha. So why is it that they did not partition Sin? Oh, Sin as well. Number okay. one. Achha. Number two is, did Jinnah propose uh, a transfer of population. Okay, good. Muslim. Uh, great questions. Pakistan. Did you, great questions. Yeah. Let me respond. Yeah. So, these two, I want your opinion. I am giving and my opinion, what sir. What would have happened Take if the transfer of population? Okay, yeah. okay. Take Thank you so much. I think these are key questions, yes. fundamental questions, which I have dealt with in my book. So one, I strongly recommend you purchase it and read it. Huh? <laughs> but responding to it right now would be like this, that on the 23rd of March, when the Lahore resolution was passed, one week later, Sardar Sundar Singh Majithia of the Sikh Nationalist Party said that if the Muslim League doesn't consider India as its homeland, then those parts of Punjab in which Muslims are not in a majority, we would see to it that they are not part of Pakistan. They should either be given to a Sikh state or to India. So already one week after the Lahore resolution, the Sikhs came out demanding the partition of Punjab in case India was partitioned on the basis of religion. Similarly in Bengal, the Hindu Mahasabha took up the same position. And the Congress party struggled till the very end to keep India united. But uh, when on the 4th of March, communal riots broke out in Punjab, and especially in Rawalpindi, the Sikh villages were surrounded and massacred in large numbers. That's on the 8th of uh, March 1947 that the Congress finally passed a resolution that we support the Sikh demand for the partition of Punjab in case India is partitioned. So Jinnah wanted India to be partitioned on the basis of religion so that Pakistan or Pakistans could be created in those areas where they were in a majority. This was counted then by the Sikhs and then the Hindu Mahasabha. And the Congress finally realizing that partition is now going to take place then supported the demand for the partition of these two provinces. Now coming to the Sindh. The problem of Sindh was that although Hindus were 29% of the population, they were dispersed all over, except for the districts of Tharparkar. There, there was a slight Hindu majority. But in all other parts of Sindh, there were Hindus everywhere, mostly Amils and Bhaibans, but they were nowhere in a majority. Whereas in the 29 districts of Punjab, undivided Punjab, 17 had a Muslim majority and 12 had a Hindu Sikh majority. So similarly in Bengal, in a number of districts, the Hindus were in a majority and then Muslims in a majority in the other districts. But in Sindh, unfortunately, 
the Hindus were everywhere, but nowhere in a majority except in Tharparkar. And I think in Tharparkar, the local Muslim leader said that we will uh, protect you, so, and they agreed, I think. Only one district could not have opted out of Sindh. And I can tell you that whereas in Punjab, the Muslims attacked the Hindus and Sikhs in a vicious manner, and then the Muslims of East Punjab were attacked in a similar way, Sindhi Muslims did not attack their Hindu and Sikh brethren. It is the Urdu-speaking lot who came from uh, Bihar and Delhi and all. When they came, they wanted houses, they wanted businesses, and from whom could they get these things? From the Hindus who were living there. So it's from January 48 onwards that the Hindus are forced out. Although in some cases, attacks on Hindus and Sikhs started taking place even earlier. But nothing comparable to what happened in Punjab. That's the difference. Okay? Yeah. We have the last few questions, three or four questions. Either way, I'll just come back. 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 Sir, he had a second question. He wanted to know about the complete transfer of population. Yes, transfer of population. Okay, okay. Great idea. In 9th, you know, first on the 16th of August, Jinnah's direct action leads to a massacre of Muslims in Cal uh, Hindus, Muslims in Calcutta. It's called the Great Calcutta Killing. Afterwards, the Marwadis then armed Hindu uh, Bihari workers in Calcutta to go and attack the Muslims of Bihar. And in Bihar, about five to 7,000 Muslims were killed. One-sided massacre of Muslims in Bihar. And on that occasion, Jinnah said that we will have to consider the partition, uh, the exchange of population. But I think later on, people told him, whatever Pakistan you get, if the, if the Muslims from the whole of India are forced into Pakistan, Pakistan would collapse under the weight of the millions of Muslims, 35 Muslims. In 1930, 47, the population of West Pakistan was 33.7 million. So if another 35 million Muslims had been thrown out by the Indian government, Pakistan would collapse there and then. That is when Jinnah uh, stopped talking about an exchange of population. And he made this 11 August speech that in this great state of Pakistan, Hindus will cease to be Hindus and Muslims will cease to be Muslims, not in a religious sense but as citizens with equal rights. And so Jinnah made this statement not because he had been converted to a secular idea of anything. This was the only way to prevent India throwing all Muslims out into Pakistan. And that's what happened. But would it better for both the countries in the partition since it is based on since it is based on religion, it will have been a complete uh, separation of religion. But I think you are... No, I think but just let me respond. Yeah. This is the myth. There were many Muslims who remained opposed to the partition. I can give you uh, Hussain Ahmad Madni, the, the president of the Deoband school, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, uh, Allah Bak Sumru of Sindh, so many of these leaders were opposed to the partition. On the 27th of April 1940 in Delhi, five times more Muslim delegates had arrived to oppose the partition. But the British were supporting Jinnah and the landlord class. And, it's th and it is that lobby who finally gave the partition. So it's another myth that all Muslims wanted the partition. Sorry? It's a half cooked food. Half cooked? Kya hai? Half cooked. <laughs> half cooked. Incomplete transfer. You mean to say half cooked food? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Why? That I agree. That I agree. That I agree. Had 
the Hindus and Sikhs stayed on in what became West Pakistan, they would be 21% of the population. But by December 1947, all of them had to flee or chose to leave. And by December 1947, only 1.6% Hindus were left and all of them in Sindh interior. Whereas in 1947, the number of Muslims who according to the 3 June plan would have stayed on in India, excluding East Punjab, would have been 9.8%, who are now 15%. So India's record of dealing with its minorities has been far more humane, far more, far more enlightened than what we did. But now with the hindsight, there is an argument that if pa Pakistan was created for Muslims, then all Muslims should have gone to Pakistan, alone Hindus should have come to India. That's another way of looking at it. Okay? My name is, Am Asalaamu Alaikum sir. My name is Amit Singh. Uh, I'm a freelancer into advertising here. So, my, mine is not a question. I'm just sharing my existence over here. Mm. My ancestors have come from Lahore in 1832. Wow, you are. <laughs> 1832. That's when Mr. Sri Chandulal Sahib was Prime Minister in, Niza, in Nizam's rule. <coughs> so there was some sort of uh, requirement. So he has suggested, that's what I've read, to the then ruler of Hyderabad, His Excellency Nizam's. So a section of soldiers were invite, requested in, uh, and invited over here to Hyderabad. So they came from Lahore to Hyderabad by walk and they served in the governance here for their requirement of, of various duties. Mm. So I think I'm the sixth generation mm. from Lahore. But uh, I don't know whether you people have got some records of history of that. Here, here is my question. If you could uh, establish this kind of record, what I'm looking for, my ancestors, if, if I were to go back to my forefathers, I don't know who they are and how they, they used to look. There's a missing link. So this is what I just wanted to share. This, this. And well, my grandfather was Rizaldar in Nizam's uh, forces. Right? And, uh, he has posted, I mean, they have posted. They came in 1932, you said? 1832, 1832. 1832. This, this was during Maharaj Ranjit Singh times rule. 1832. 1832. 1832. And I think I'll, I'll be the sixth generation. If I, I were see. to go back and find out my forefathers, some, there will be somebody in Lahore. 1832. I think as a Sikh, you have a far better chance of going to Pakistan than a Punjabi Hindu. Okay. So take advantage of it. And if you get there, I'll help you there in Lahore with trying to trace if you could, If you could establish some records of, of that period. I think in the civil service okay. secretariat, there must be some record. Okay, okay, but you need the contacts and all to make that possible. So if you ever get to Lahore, just get in touch with me. Let's sure. see. Sure. We might be able to help. Thank you very much, sir. A uh, very quick question, sir. Uh, I know that uh, with all your experiences and your academic scholarship, uh, would you like to comment on this? From 10 years now, where would be Pakistan heading? And similar question to sir, where would be India heading next 10 years? With all your scholarship, all your academic, Consider, where are we heading? You know, this question you pose is a typical question which all young people go and ask astrologers. <coughs> you know, they are love, in love with some woman or they want to get out of a country. So the answer they give, 50% will be true. So I don't know in 10 years where they would be. But if Pakistan continues with its self-destructive, I say nihilistic, nihilistic I'd, mode of thinking, Pakistan would be destroyed. So Pakistan must rectify its way of dealing with its internal issues and regional issues. About India, Mohanji would be a better... <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one thing very clear. <laughs> one thing is very clear. The population of India by the end of this year will stabilize 
at 1.4 billion. And then there will be no, the, will reach equalization and then you will have a negative growth rate starting from 2040. And there will be census of And there will be less people and an older population. So the demographic dividend is going. Okay. Pakistan has got a birth rate of 4.6, among the highest in the world. It's also They've, decreasing now, I think, but still slightly. the highest. But Pakistan yeah. would be, by 2050, will be about 400 million strong. And with huge problems, huge problems, economic problems. A youthful population gives with you a lot of problems. Whereas we are going to be an old society. Already you see the signs of aging in the south. All our workmen today around Hyderabad are from UP and Bihar and Orissa. There are no local people doing any. Menial jobs. Not menial, skilled jobs. There are no welders from Hyderabad. All the welders are from UP and from Bihar. All the, sewer, the drainage people are from Orissa. So the skilled labor also, we are dependent on them. The nurses are from Chhattisgarh. So that will start. Now you can't have 500 million people sitting in one country under primitive conditions, with primitive thoughts, with something not happening, spilling across. So there are future dangers coming up. And it would be in our interest to start looking at Pakistan's economic well-being. When the Pakistan wanted 1.2 billion dollars from the IMF this time, and they were begging and crawling, that was the time for India to say, "Okay, here's 1.2 billion. We gave Sri Lanka 7 billion." Uh, let me intervene here, sir. There was a, a flood disaster, and uh, they said, "We'll take aid from everyone." but India. So Pakistan closes its own Men doors on India all be, the time. That's the problem. No, Sri That's Lanka, the problem. Huh? Sri Lanka, hmm. we saw it all coming. Hmm. Four years ago, five years ago, there was a conference in Colombo where I was also invited. And I said, you know, the, what is going to happen is written in your economics. Yeah. Your, your outflows are so great. So then they said, what will happen to us? So I said, Jeb, you know? So, I think a time will come for Pakistan when the back is broken, the heart is broken, they'll have to come to us. And we have also in our interest got to sort out some of their problems. Abhi, uh, the northern plains are water scarcity areas. They're all dependent on the aquifers. And both India and Pakistan are running down the aquifers without ground, groundwater mapping. Because the armies on both sides say, Ki, inko, don't let them map. So I think we'll have to start cooperating in different places. There are issues of common. Pakistan will have a bigger problem because the Indus Basin is drying up. And the glaciers are melting. That's why they're having floods. We will have, we are dependent on the monsoons and for as long as the monsoons are holding, we will have rainfall, but by 2050, 2060, we will also start drying up. So we need to start talking. Again, you know, but at this moment, the mood in both countries is ki Pakistan go cricket match mein hara hai to, you know, country goes into paroxysm, chutti ho jata hai. But I think we need to settle down and get some good sense going. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm Jasmine Jairat. Uh, I belong to district. Ko belong karti hu. Wow, wow. So, bachpan mera Punjab mein guzra hai and sure. gone through the whole. Of course, I'm a post-partition person. Hmm. Uh, I have about two, three issues. Just a comment. Ki kuch zikr hua tha is mehfil mein ki janoon ka, ki sanatan ka janoon nahi hai. Wo to hum aajkal 
अपने देश में बहुत देख रहे हैं और क्योंकि मुस्लिम्स की जो फैक्ट बेस्ड लिंचिंग हो रही है ऑल थ्रू ऑन रिकॉर्ड और वो ये सनातन के जुनून से ही हो रही है बट माई वन क्वेश्चन इज कि जब हम हिंदू रेफर करते हैं एंड ऑल्सो टू यू सर वॉट डू वी अंडरस्टैंड बाई हिंदू बिकॉज दिस इज अ वेरी ब्रॉड टर्म एंड वेदर यू आर रेफरिंग टू सनातन आर्य समाज और ब्राह्मिन्स और और दलित्स और इंटर कास्ट और चारवाक्यज और वॉट यू हैव सो आई डोंट नो वॉट वॉट दैट मीन्स सो आई थिंक द इशू दैट हैज़ टू बी रेज सो दैट विल डिटर्मिन द पोलिटिकल सपोर्ट फॉर वेल एंटी मुस्लिम मुस्लिम और वॉट एवर बट ऑन दैट इशू इट इज़ पर्टिनेंट दैट इट्स नॉट वन फ्लैट जेनेरिक टर्म दूसरी बात है जिना साहब के बारे में ही वॉज पर्सनली एज अ पर्सनैलिटी He was not a practicing Muslim, a religious Muslim, a communal-minded person. There was a point at which he was very much for United India and all. He was a part of the Congress, etc. That you've mentioned, and what made him turn into that kind of a political Muslim, and then led on to all the things that you mentioned. Yes. The third question is that while in Punjab there was a lot of bloodshed on both sides. But there was a small uh, Nawabi estate, Maler Kotla, which was a totally even today it is totally Muslim dominated. That did not see any bloodshed by the local, maybe majority Sikhs or Sikhs and Hindus, and uh, remained peaceful. And those Muslims voluntarily decided to continue to stay and they are still staying there today quite and there is no uh, i mean there are a lot of stories of amity between the local population uh, and the maler kotla muslim population ah, there are a lot of incidents and uh, bjp has absolutely no role or no effectiveness around punjab generally but also not. it's okay yeah ji ji thank you for thank you ha ji ha ji ha ji हाँ नहीं 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 आई एम आई एम ऑन योर साइड मैम आई एम ऑन योर स्पॉन्ड टू यू ठीक है हाँ जी ठीक है फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल हु इज अ हिंदू हु इज नॉट अ हिंदू नॉट फॉर मी टू डिसाइड अ हिंदू इज वन हु सेज आई एम अ हिंदू दैट्स ऑल एंड वेदर ही इज सनातन धर्म और आर्य समाज और दियो समाज और ब्राह्मो समाज और एन एथिस्ट is is for him to decide or her to decide second was your question about punjab jina uh, no i i say that jina's uh, so called uh, secular character is in his dietary habits he used to have a ham sandwich and a regular drink all the time ha ji so i have said uh if food habits determine the ideology of a person then hitler was a vegetarian by the way so how do you explain all the bloodshed that he caused in the world so i don't think personal food preferences are very important to determine determine the politics of a person jena 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 was used islam instrumentally there was no commitment on his part i know it for a fact that he didn't even know the proper kalama and 1936 when he came to lahore and was taken to the badshah mosque for the friday prayers uh, as he entered he was going in with his shoes and he was told please this can't be done but before going there bolana abdul hamid bada yuni had told him the hanafi way of how the prayers are done without knowing the prayers at all and this is what he did but one thing uh, bada yuni had forgot to tell him was that at the end of it when the imam sahab who's leading the prayer says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and then he says assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah on this side when he said assalamu alaikum jinna sahab said wa alaikum assalam <laughs> तो ये है जिना साहब का इस्लाम उन्होंने अपनी सियासत के लिए इसे इस्तेमाल किया है एंड ही गॉट अवे विद इट बिकॉज द ब्रिटिश फाइनली डिसाइडेड फॉर पार्टीशन सो द फाइनल डिसीजन रेस्ट विद द ब्रिटिश 
the demand for partition is by Jinnah. The demand for the partition of Punjab is by the Sikh leadership and Hindu Mahasabha Bengal. So that's how you have to see who did what. The final question was what? Ah, Malher Kotla, you know, in my book, uh, The Punjab Bloodied, Partition and Cleansed, although I got a grant for three years, I kept on working on it for 11 years to complete the whole thing. And I interviewed people, about 400 of them, of which 262 interviews are reported. But then you have gone to the government of uh, Tribune and Pakistan Times, you know, these newspapers. So all the record is there. I also went to Malir Kotla and met the Muslims there. The story is that uh, when Guru Gobind Singh was uh, being pursued by the Mughals, his children were also escaping Mughal uh, uh, detection. Huh? So they came to the Malir Kotla territory. And the Mughal emperor had ordered them that whosoever comes here should be arrested. And the Nawab Sahib of Malir Kotla took the position that I will not cooperate because in Islam, the problem is with the, with the father and not with the children. So this, is, this has no basis in my faith. And apparently Guru Gobind Singh said that in a future conflict with Muslims, you are not to attack the Muslims of Malir Kotla. And so when I was doing the interviews, I met a man whose reputation was all over, who is reported to have killed 3,000 Muslims. And I met him. And he had two names, sometimes Ranjit Singh, sometimes Amit Singh or some whatever. And this is what he said to me in Punjabi. Ke Bauji, jeda musla angreji sahib te si, onu asi chadya ni. Te jeda maler kotla vad gaya, onu asi at ni laya. Yani, ke if a Muslim was on the English side of the road, then he was a legitimate target. But if he crossed this road, which was about, let's say, 10 feet, and entered the princely state of Malir Kloter's territory, then we didn't touch him. So the thousands of Muslims who survived largely did it because of this uh, belief of Guru Gobind Singh saying Ken Koni Karna. But there is another factor also, which I mention in the book, two factors. So I've responded to your question. But please get my book. The latest edition is by, in, in this I've included four poems as well. Amrita Pridham, Gulzar Sahib, then Faiz Sahib, and I think the greatest poem on the partition, not very often mentioned, actually not mentioned at all, is by Sahir Ludhyanvi. Sahir Ludhyanvi. Ah, okay. It's called Mufahamat. Mufahamat means the compromise. And the compromise is that we all came out fighting for the freedom of India, but in order to be free, we had to agree to the division of, 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 of people as well. So all these poems are there. Haji? Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, so my name is Sanjay. I'm a management consultant. Uh, my question is actually getting back to two of your books. and One of them has been answered thanks to uh, yeah. uh, Jasmine in her second question, where I was also curious as to what was the issue that actually made uh, Jinnah turn around and uh, become uh, such a uh, which you actually partially answered. So my, my version of looking at that question was that was there, was there an angst that Jinnah of having been marginalized by Gandhi? Yes, yes, yes. If you of read course. my book, yeah. my yeah. main yeah. argument is... But Nehru was his, his... Because I think Gandhi pushed Nehru instead of Jinnah in the entire process. No, but no, Jinnah yes. left the Congress, so he, Gandhi could not have pushed Jinnah. Okay. Although in 1946... On the 6th of April 1947, Gandhi ji proposed to the cabinet mission plan through Major White, who was one of the interlocutors, that Jinnah Sahib can become the Prime Minister and he can even choose the cabinet. But in the Gandhi film, it's shown that when this was told to Nehru and Patel, they didn't like it. But the actual fact is 
that this was conveyed to Lord Bevel, who was the Viceroy, and he overruled it. He said that under the 1935 Act, real power is vested in the Governor General, so there can't be a Prime Minister. So this is not mentioned in either Pakistani research or Indian research because blaming the British for this would be too much because then the grants to go to Oxford and Cambridge would dry up. Yeah, so yeah, finally, it is again imperialism which is actually allowing tradition. So that oh, actually makes… It's a bad thing. We have said that Mohamed Ali Johar said that we divide and you rule. So this is the truth. So actually then looking at the second part of the question in which you mentioned about uh, how the Israeli uh, as well as the, 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 you know, the, uh, the racism comes and the imperialism comes in for the decision making. Yeah. So the whole story actually started from East India Company itself. Absolutely. And uh, the entire process of even proselytizing as well as writing history their way to actually create these impressions and, uh, and, and the, uh, the schisms that have subsequently got uh, magnified was a part of the larger game plan that these guys always had for, uh, for, for actually co uh, for perpetual colonization. As I said, in 1943, while the Second World War was going on, the decision was that till 1973 we are here to stay. This is Lord Lilithgo telling Lord Wavell and I have quoted that. So they had no intention of giving up India. All the hunting and all the, you know, thing, this was the crown colony. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that would essentially mean that the Americans are continuing the story now. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. The balkanization of the country. That's right. One last question. I just want to project into the future, not the past. No, it doesn't matter. So future, not there. I feel as you are also saying, geopolitical and economic reasons which has created all this problem. Not only for us, but also two other major partitions we have seen in the world recent times, Germany and Vietnam. And both the countries got united, overruled the West, overruled everybody else, and they are now very, very good economically and of course politically very strong. Unless perhaps India and Pakistan realize, as Mr. Musawi said, in their interest and maybe a push from the West comes because China is now perceived as a common enemy and if they have also made to understand that this country, these two countries are united, then it will be much better for the entire region. I think we have to do it in two stages. Do First, you the SARC framework is excellent to begin with and once the trust is built then maybe the borders can also be abolished. But one can't go from a divided subcontinent suddenly to everybody uniting in one go. So this will have to be a process which would be voluntary and which would be based on some sort of rational calculation and trust. So it's a hundred years project, I think, not immediate project. Immediately we want the end to the confrontation between India and Pakistan. The trade should be revived and people should, 65 above, have the right to travel, visa, easy uh, sort of things. So we have to start on a modest level and let's hope finally this sort of thing happens. Amin, Amin. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ishtiak Ahmed and Mohan, for this brilliant, intellectually stimulating talk. And I must thank all of you, the audience, for taking the time out on a working day, uh, battling through the Hyderabad traffic, and staying and asking intelligent, pertinent questions, which I think have taxed so both our speakers also. Thank you very much. And uh, if you would like to subscribe to the Guru Swami Center uh, event uh, group, uh, Mr. Datta Prasad is there. Please give him your email ID or phone number for WhatsApp group. You will be kept updated for about all the programs that are held at the center. Yes, these are all available on Amazon. Uh, just a light-hearted aside here, uh, 
Dr. Ahmed has talked about three of his books, about the book on Punjab, about the book on Jinnah, about the book on the Pakistan, the garrison state. What he has not talked about is that he has written a fourth book, which is on the contribution of pre-partition Punjab to Indian cinema. And by the way, he's an excellent singer. Uh, whose music was composed by a Hyderabadi, Abdur Rauf Usmania. And this was the, for the film Tofa, 1945, uh, rendered by Mukesh Ji. And the lyrics of the ghazal are by Saqib Lakhnavi. Haji. So, if you are saying so much, I don't know if I will manage. But the little I can, okay? <coughs> कहाँ तक जफ़ा हुसन वालों की सेते जवानी जो रहती तो फिर हम न रहते कहाँ तक जफ़ा नशे मन न जलता निशानी तो रहती नशे मन न जलता निशानी तो रहती हमारा था क्या ठीक रहते न रहते हमारा था क्या कोई नक्श और कोई दीवार समझा कोई नक्श और कोई दीवार समझा जमाना हुआ हमको चुप रहते रहते जमाना हुआ जमाना बड़े शौक से सुन रहा था हम ही सो गए दासता कहते कहते कहाँ तक जफ़ा हुसन वालों कि सेते जवानी जो रहती तो फिर हम न रहते आपको गाना भी हैदराबाद का जैनमेन सुना दिया है ये सारी कंपोजिशन भैरवी राग के अंदर है और अब्दुल रूफ उस्मानिया ने सिर्फ दो फिल्मों में ये गाने किए हैं और मैं समझता हूँ मुकेश साहब के बड़ी रेंडिंग में से एक ये है और ये सबसे पहले मैंने 1972 में व्हेन आई वेंट टू टीच एट गॉर्डन कॉलेज रावलपिंडी वहाँ एक मैं फिल्म में सुना था तो यू नो ब्यूटी क्रिएटेड एनी वेयर इज ऑलवेज यूनिवर्सल तो रावलपिंडी हो कहीं हो इस किस्म की चीजें चलती रहती हैं ठीक है जी बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया आपका हाँ ये उस्तादों का शेर है बहुत बड़ा शेर है साकिब लखनवी साहब का वाजिब वाजिब मैंने कहा हैदराबाद की अच्छा यही वाली वाह यार पता होता तो मैं मिलना चाहता था उनको क्योंकि मैं समझता हूँ अच्छा 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 चले वाजी वाह 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 वो है हमारे हैदराबादी लव्स में सब इधर आ और वो गाना है हम बहुत वेट करते थे सुनने के लिए इस चीज को समदन खो गई माँ चार मीनार के सड़क पो 
इधर देखो उधर देखो चार मीनार की गलियां अरे इधर देखो उधर देखो ठिपिक 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 ढोलक बज रही इधर देखो उधर देखो चार मीनार की गलिया समदन मिल गई माँ चुड़िया वालों की दुकान पे समदन मिल गई माँ चार मीनार के सड़क पे और आगे के वर्ड्स याद नहीं है मुझे बहरहाल इसमें चार पांच ऐसे और अच्छे हैं पंजाबी वो थोड़े से शेरी सुनाता हूँ हाँ जी ये मेरी मदर को बड़ा पसंद था और मैं समझता हूँ कि नूर जहान के बड़े गानों में से एक है और उन्होंने बहुत बहुत बड़े गाने गाए हैं तो ये है कली कली जान दुख लखते करोड़ वे दूर जान वाले आ मोहरा हुन मोड़ वे कली कली जान दुख चन्ना तेरी याद नाल दुख सफोलिया दुख सफोलिया हौली हौली हंजुआ बुआज खोलिया बुआज खो लिया वेरी होया जग मेरा तेरी अज लोड़ वे दूर जान वाले मोहरा हुन मोड़ वे कली कली जान ठीक है जी बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया जी सर थैंक यू वो मच एंजॉय लॉट थैंक यू थैंक यू